live four o'clock rock here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy every Wednesday. This is Energy Wednesday, as all Wednesdays are. And uh, four to five is when we do Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And our, my co-host today, Ray Starling. Say hi, Ray. Hi, Ray. <laughs> well done, Ray. He's not cooperating. <laughs> and, and the man in the middle is, uh, is uh, uh, Jim Albers, Senior Vice President of Customer Service at Hawaiian Electric. So let's talk to you first, Jim. There's been a number of press releases lately, and uh, a lot of them, you know, uh, are in your court. Sure. So can you talk about what's been going on at Hawaiian Electric? Sure. A couple of them right up front, uh, all relating to rooftop solar. So recently we put out a press release to talk about the adoption rate of rooftop solar and how it's grown exponentially. So to give you some statistics, we've got 77,000 either installed or approved rooftop solar systems in Hawaii. And on Oahu in particular, that's 32% of all single family homes, 17% of all customers. Now we've recently switched over from net energy metering last October to new, two new programs called customer grid supply and customer self supply programs. And we started receiving applications for those and the approvals have also started to flow. So since last October, we've approved about 3,000 new grandfathered net energy metering customers, as well as uh, several hundred new customer grid supply applications. And today, right before I walked up here, I heard we have approved the very first customer self-supply application, which is the non-export version of that. And the other piece that's really exciting, we signed an agreement with a local company, eGear, Chris DeBone and Steve Godmere's company, to do a project on Molokai, because Molokai is the island that is first hit in a situation of excess energy. So we're looking for a storage solution there, and, and we've been testing their solution with them for a year, and it's ready to go. So we've written a deal, and we've got teams getting together next week to go start deploying those solutions on Molokai to see if we can get that queue rolling again. So I'm really excited about that. And a lot of times I hear people say, uh, we wish Hawaiian Electric would be more innovative. And you know, I just wanted to, to say today, from my perspective, I feel like we're really leading the way from an innovation perspective across the industry. And I wrote down a couple of quick notes. Uh, the things we just talked about, really high adoption rates for PV, those are industry leading statistics. We've got projects with a company called STEM, we just put a project out with a company called Freewire for mobile uh, vehicle charging. I moderated a panel with STEM. They were very good. Yeah. I was very excited with what they were doing on storage. I mean, if you look around and just roll all this up into one place, the number of innovations that are happening in Hawaii regarding energy systems and energy transformation, it's pretty astounding. And the rate that it's happening here, even though some people may feel it might be moving too slow, it's moving at lightning speed compared to most other places. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. I'm excited mostly for our customers because our customers get to save money on their bills this way. Yeah, I mean, Alan Oshima said a, a year ago that he was gonna move these through the pipeline, and he is. Yeah. He, he really is. And today is Alan's birthday, so everybody say right? happy birthday to Alan. Uh, well, okay. Happy, uh, uh, you want to sing? No. No, we'll just say it. <laughs> Happy birthday, Alan Oshima. <laughs> if you were here, we would sing for you. Excellent. Next time, maybe. <laughs> okay, Ray, is there any question you want to ask Jim? Well, no, it uh, <laughs> sounds like he's covered the waterfront here. And, uh, and, and I agree that uh, things are going much, much faster here than they are anywhere else that I'm aware of. And uh, I'm glad to see it. I just heard some new things today. I didn't didn't realize. So this is hot off the press. You know, the thing that the thing that really tells me that that we're innovating a lot in Hawaii is that we're attracting new projects. So people come all the time to Hawaii because they see how things are moving, and they want to be part of it. So today or yesterday, I just read in the paper about a new project for offshore wind, a really large project, 10 miles offshore. Uh, eventually those kind of renewable projects are going to be thought through, but just the fact that Hawaii is this test bed to, to want to recruit people to come here and try it out, that's what's really good. Now at the end of the day we have to get a good, uh, good deal for our customers, 
because our goal and our commitment is to help people lower their bills. So we have to get a good price on the rates. With all this, uh, do you think we'll be able to make the 2045 100% renewables? I really do. Uh, so we're ahead of schedule right now. And 2045 is a long way out. So we're looking at things in increments, trying to make sure that we've got milestones in the middle there so we can hit those targets. And when we look at those targets, uh, we're confident we're going to make them. Great. Now, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a mix, though, when I say that. Uh, diversity is the key. So, you know, trying to have a good mix. And if you look across the islands, in particular, Hawaii Island uh, is nearly 50% renewables already, which is world class. But they do it through diversity. Uh, some geothermal, wind, hydro, solar. Uh, and that's what we really have to look for on all the islands is that opportunity. Great, Jim. And great for the customers and great for Hawaiian Electric. I know you guys have been, uh, you know, under um, a burden of that proceeding with the PUC and NextEra. And I appreciate uh, you've got to participate in that and be involved in it. But uh, when you're free of it, I hope that's soon. Um, I hope you can come down and, and, and give us regular reports on these kinds of things so we can stay in touch with you and with, uh, you know, these innovations. Great. I'd be happy to. And I, and I want to put in a plug for Ray, too. I think the energy efficiency front, when I think of all of the things we work on, they typically revolve around new sources of generation. But from a practical point of view, everybody should focus on doing energy efficiency first, then look at how much generation we need to serve that load. Because doing it in a reverse means people are going to spend money. They're not going to get a good return on it. So appreciate all you do. Well, I, I thank you. you know, I think you just gave us a megawatt moment. <laughs> I really don't have to do one uh, today. So Why don't you do what's left of it now, Ray? We have a few minutes. Okay. And I know you have a video you want to show. Well, well, it's a very quick video. Uh, and, and basically, you know, we're always looking for ways to save energy. And uh, there's some new product lines on, on the market now that we've been looking at. And we've recently approved We've had solar hot water for a long time, but we now have uh, a hot water heat pump. And the, uh, the video that you're looking at uh, online right now is, uh, is touting that. And we give rebates for uh, hot water uh, heat pumps. And if you don't have roof space to put uh, solar hot water you can do this and it actually in some cases will save you more electricity than the uh, the solar uh, hot water system so uh, we're pushing this now go to our website hawaiienergy.com and uh, and take a look and there's a list of uh, uh, contractors and uh, sales folks who sell these uh, hot water heat pumps and uh, you can pick one out and go take a look and compare the prices and then come see us about a rebate. What is a, a hot water heat pump, just for the, the okay. record? So, so the <laughs> traditional old hot so, water So heater, they should know what you're It looks about. very much like a, a traditional electric hot water heater, uh, only in the, hot, the traditional heater it had heating elements that just heated up really hot, much hotter than it needed to be in order to make the water warm. Uh, but they used more electricity than it now appears that you need. With a hot water heat pump, you, you merely use a mechanism, the heat pump part, to move heat out of the air and into the water. And it doesn't heat it as hot as the elements that used to uh, fire up the, or still do fire up the, the electric uh, heat pumps. Uh, I'm sorry, the electric uh, element heat, heating uh, uh, hot water heaters. So we've got this on the market now. Uh, again, if you can't, uh, you don't have roof space, can't, can't make uh, it work, you've got a big tree that, that would cover up a solar hot water heater, this is a great way to go. And we're rebating it, and uh, you, you can get it right now online at uh, hawaiienergy.com. Okay. Uh, Jim, do you have any questions or comments about Ray's... Uh, weekly promotion here? No, I'm a big fan and uh, I think Ray and his team do a great job promoting and advocating for energy efficiency here in Hawaii. It's such a, an important tool and it 
it has to stay a focus for us because that's our biggest return on investment. And, and for us as a state, for every kilowatt hour we take out means we never have to serve that. Whereas if you have a really large PV system and a cloud comes over, we have to fill that space. Uh, so energy efficiency is a great investment. It's a great tool. And we just need to make sure it, ha it stays very visible for everyone. Yeah. It's one part of the renewable <coughs> ecosystem. Yep, it That's really true. is. Okay, on that note, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll go to the main part of our show, which involves transportation targets. We'll be right back. Aloha, my name is Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm the host of Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. We air live on the internet and also on Oceanic Channel 16. I would invite you to come for a fresh new show every Tuesday from 12 to 1 o'clock. I try to bring on guests that give us a different viewpoint on aspects of sustainability in Hawaii as well as trying to unpack some of the difficult concepts of measuring and achieving sustainability, particularly with regard to sustainable economic growth and prosperity in Hawaii. Please join us every Tuesday from 12 to 1 p.m. Mahalo, aloha. Aloha, this is Reg Baker and I am the host of Business in Hawaii. We talk about positive stories positive stories of businesses in Hawaii, how they have been successful, and how they have overcome some of the obstacles that a lot of us encounter when we try to have a business here. And believe it or not, there are a number of positive stories here, and we want to talk to all of you. So we broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock, uh, and it rebroadcasts again on Olelo Channel 54. So I sure hope to see you next time. Please tune in on Thursdays at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. I am Anu Hittel, and I host a show on climate change. It's called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. And in it, we go beyond outrage to look at solutions to global climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. Join me every Tuesday at 1 o'clock Hawaii Standard Time Aloha, namaskar, and goodbye. Aloha. Hello, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host of Global Connections here at ThinkTech Hawaii. We broadcast live every Thursday at 1 p.m. We bring Hawaii to the world and the world to Hawaii, talking about international events and various things of interest to the audience. Please join me. I look forward to talking with you and having you get, get to meet some of my guests. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Hello, I'm Stephen Katz, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap, which comes to you live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com and then it's repeated again whenever you want if you go to the website. On our show we will be talking to all different kinds of therapists, psychologists, psychoanalysts, psychiatrists, people who talk about the mind, the brain, and about different ways to find happiness. Um, I myself am a marriage and family therapist in practice here in Hawaii, and I hope you will join us because I've got a lot to learn, you've got a lot to learn, and it's a great ride. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Okay, we're back. We're live. Uh, Jim Alberts is Senior Vice President of uh, Customer Service at Hawaiian Electric is gone. Ray Starling, my co-host, is still here. And to his right, Mark Glick uh, of the Hawaii State Energy Office at DBED. And to his right, Shem Lawler uh, of Blue Planet Foundation. What, a, what, a, what an esteemed group. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank Exciting. You. And this is the first of nine shows we're going to do about transportation. Uh, and the title of this show is Transportation Targets. And more specifically, uh, should we have targets? OK, I don't know what your views are. Uh, let's see. Mark, you look older, so why don't you go first? <laughs> well, thank you, Jay. <laughs> I'm only uh, guessing. 
You know, it could very well be. Uh, I won't dispute you on that. But uh, yeah, the idea of targets, we found uh, certainly in the elect electricity sector that targets really helped um, build momentum and to be able to target investments. So I think it's good you know, to have a vision, uh, to be able to articulate that. And at some point, you want to be able to have targets to shoot for and ultimately, um, in cases like transportation, um, you would consider a mandatory uh, target scheme. Is that different than 100% by 2045 for generated electricity? Well, you would look is that, at... Is that mandatory? That's not really mandatory. That, that is a mandatory So this, you're talking about the same thing as what we have for Ultim generated ultimately, renewables. Ultimately, I think you would want to have some hard goals in the transportation sector. Um, the, di the difficulty... Uh, in the transportation sector is that we're in the electricity sector you're the uh, force of compliance is the Public Utilities Commission and it's on a few actors primarily electricity utilities um, who are, who are going to be held responsible for making the um, gasoline and diesel marine uh, that's diesel a really interesting question and, and so you actually have to build a whole different compliance scheme not that it sh we shouldn't try to tackle that. It's just that you have to do that, and it has to be reasonable and effective and clear and defensible. Do we have to build the, uh, the scheme before we set the date and make, and make it mandatory? Uh, well, if, if you uh, want to make it mandatory, I think, I think you have a, have a pretty clear idea where you're, where you're going to be headed and that you can achieve it. Are we ready now? Um, to have mandatory, I think it's a little early to have uh, the mandatory so uh, elements. What, but I so think what requirements would you, you know, interpose between now and the time we're ready? Well, the interesting thing at the State Energy Office, uh, we commissioned a, an analysis uh, by the International Council for Clean Transportation uh, two years ago. Uh, that, that analysis was done last year. And it laid out uh, a whole series of tactics, 22 of those we found to be uh, realistic and ones that could be taken on. Uh, the next step for that process is to build a roadmap. And then you identify stakeholders who are willing to step up. And it's like we were talking before, who are going to be the parties that are going to accept responsibility for making those reductions? Ultimately, it will be those parties that will be obligated through some kind of firm commitment, you know, some kind of statutory commitment. But I think the, uh, it's an appropriate first step to build the roadmap and to identify these players. So you, in this new, more complex uh, area of transportation with all these different players, you can um, uh, have some sense that, that the actors involved are going to have a clearer sense of what they need to do and that they will be more willing to accept those responsibilities because you're going to force them by law to comply. Yeah, that's serious. It's very serious. So, I mean, I, I have this cold in the back of my neck feeling that the PUC is going to send me a letter somewhere that's going to say, Fidel, stop using fossil fuel in your car. You can't do that anymore. Sell your car, buy an electric vehicle, you have two weeks. Is that going to happen? Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is, I'm not sure in the transportation sector, it will be the Public Utilities Commission that will be the enforcer. So it's like, what authority do they have over transportation fuels? So, Good question. Yeah. yeah, so part of the issue, you know, like you're asking what's the right steps, is that you would clearly identify who would have the authority to enforce, and then who, we, who are you going to obligate? Once you know who you're going to obligate, who, who would be the appropriate enforcement agency. In many jurisdictions on the mainland, the, uh, the key methodology for doing these kinds of mandatory schemes have been tailpipe emissions because they're in areas with massive urban areas that don't meet ambient air quality standards, the national ambient air quality standards. We don't have that problem here. And therefore, the federal government EPA does not require us to come up with transportation improvement plans or these, you know, these uh, transportation uh, or these state implementation plans, these SIPs. And that is good because we don't have dirty air in, in the same way. Thank that, goodness for that. That's a good thing. 
but it does take away kind of a one of the methodologies that's been accepted to how, how do you deal with transportation? Well, you regulate it at the tailpipe. And then, you know, you have to reduce emissions. That doesn't necessarily get to what we're trying to achieve, which is to make us more self-sufficient. We know that's a good thing. I'm just uh, thinking aloud, but uh, why don't we say, whether by statute or by some regulatory authority, maybe not the PUC, somebody else who knows what, uh, maybe a new one. You know, that's dealing, maybe the Department of Transportation, maybe. Um, and we say, okay, we're, we're not going to give out so many registrations anymore for fossil fuel cars. You know, we, you can't register the car and you can't drive it. Right. And we're going to reduce it over time. They're going to, you know, it's going to be decremented over time. And as we get closer to whatever the target date is, I mean, uh, my thinking is it would be really neat to use the same date. That's just me. What? That would be that would be kind of nice. I mean, it'd be it'd be neat anyway. Symmetrical. <laughs> Symmetrical. Well. Right. Very mathematical. So you ramp down, right? And I can't buy a car. And at the same time, you give me some kind of incentive. Maybe not the same kind of incentive we had before, but some kind of incentive to buy an electric car. And I'm halfway home. I mean, can you do that? Uh, conceivably, yes. And and I think Shem will probably talk very effectively about all of the new technologies that are coming out that will allow you to penetrate your, basically replace your vehicles at high enough rates where you'll be able to make a difference. And that's one of our goals at the state as well. Okay, he's, he's talking for you, Shem. Right. I think this is your turn now. All right, uh, uh, yeah. So let me uh, um, go back a little bit and talk about whether or not um, any kind of mandate is, is needed. I actually don't think that we need a mandate, an overall mandate for the ground transportation sector and the reason I don't think we do is because I don't think it would be effective. Whereas in the electricity sector, you have a few, a very limited number of, of actors. In transportation, you have literally millions of individual actors. I don't think it's necessary. Well, 1.3 anyway. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's necessary. I think that we, that we have a number of tools that we can use to push us in the direction we want to go. There's market tools. There's policy tools. And actually, there's we have a lot of things that are actually pushing us in that direction right now. So for example, one thing that people don't realize is that the number of drivers in the state of Hawaii is actually on the decline. Even though the population is increasing, actually the number of licensed drivers started mm -hmm. declining in 2011. It's a good thing, isn't it? It is a good thing. It is a good thing. Why? But why? Well, there's two main trends that are driving this. The first one, the, the, the biggest one actually is... Traffic? No, it's... it's <laughs> okay, potholes. It's actually our, young, our young, younger generation are not getting their driver's licenses. And so I mean, they're getting in much lower ratios. So, to put a number on that, uh, from 2000 to 2015, the number of licensed drivers in the state in the 15 to 24 age group dropped from 65% of the population to only 46%. So less than half of people between f ages of 15 and 24 in the state of Hawaii have their driver's licenses. Age 25 to 29 in that same time period dropped from 99% to 65%. So it's a huge drop. I've seen that. You know? Right. I, I mean, talk to these millennials. They don't have any interest in a car. Any other mode would be OK right. for them, but not a car. Right. I, you know, it reminds me of <coughs> living in New York. Nobody has a car in New right. York. Seinfeld didn't have a car. You right. notice that? In the show, <laughs> he never had a car, nor did any of his friends in the right. apartment. Well, I think Kramer had a car at one point. Kramer, <laughs> right. yeah. I think he drove to Michigan to recycle or something. Uh, the, other, the other part of that trend is that we have a very large baby boomer population that over the next 30 years is going to be aging out of driving. And so overall, we expect the total number of drivers, we, we did some modeling on it with the uh, DBEDS population projections in 2040, and we expect the number of drivers to drop from about 900,000 today to 775,000 or so. That's so interesting, right. because in my lifetime here in Hawaii, when I arrived in Hawaii, the, the, the taxi cab that picked me up at the airport was a Cadillac. I said, my God, we don't have Cadillacs anywhere in the country. It's <laughs> taxi cabs. What's going on here? And I realized you know, fairly quickly in the game that Hawaii loves cars. People really love cars. I mean, all those kids out there want to go to automobile repair school. That's what their careers yeah. are. And they spend all their free money and time on their cars and trucks. Yeah. And now it's changing. Right. This is so remarkable and good to hear. Right. It's uh, definitely different uh, uh, social desirability in terms of driving versus yeah. other. Yeah. Uh, so you think that solves the problem? Social. Well, it gets us part of the way there. The other thing that's really going to help us out is the CAFE standards that, um, that the Obama administration updated in 2012 require that new vehicles uh, 
for, in this year, 2016, the average fuel economy needs to be 35 miles per gallon. By 2025, that uh, efficiency needs to raise to 55 miles per gallon. So that we expect those cafe standards to Very continue going up. Very challenging for Detroit. Right. Well, well, it, Detroit it, and Tokyo both. It is. But what you'll <laughs> see is the, the auto manufacturers are going to have to start producing more and more hybrids and more and more electric vehicles because that, that feeds into their overall average fuel economy. Yeah. And so even if we don't do anything, we expect the total number of, the total amount of gasoline and diesel in the state to drop by about 60 to 70 percent between now and 2045. So we, we have some opportunity. We can, we can do uh, implement policies that, that build off of that to increase alternative modes of transportation, decrease the miles um, people have to drive even when they continue to drive. But we there are still going to be pe people out there, like the people you know, that I have grown up with in the state of Hawaii, who love cars. Right. And they're not going to give them up anytime soon. And if you set a target, let's just say for the sake of argument, it's 2045, right. about zero fossil fuel on the highway they're not going to be happy. You're going to have to find a way to wean them or force them off. And maybe you need a statute to do that. Will you say something right? Well, I don't know. If you haven't driven a Tesla, you, <laughs> might, uh, you might need to drive one. Yeah. I think that, that would be a great, a great thrill, uh, much better than any gasoline car that I've ever oh, had. Any it's electric really, car is yeah. a thrill. So it, it really is. So I, I, I think that could So you think that would work all by itself? itself? Yeah. Well, actually, I think to... I don't think we need to force people to get rid of their cars. I think there was a big study done by DBED in, in 2010, or commissioned by DBED, that evaluated the capacity for biofuels in the state of Hawaii, just, if we, just what we could produce on our, on our own. And the study found that we could easily produce over 100 million gallons equivalent, uh, 100 million gallons per year equivalent of gasoline or diesel per year. So we think these other factors could get us below 100 million gallons, and then we can substitute biofuels, biodiesel, for cars that still have internal combustion engines. So we're not going to force people to go out and buy Teslas or EVs. They can still hold on to their cars. We expect the penetration rates of EVs and even hydrogen fu uh, fuel cell vehicles to, to reach pretty high ratios by 2045. But by no means will everybody have to drive an EV. We'll still have fuel options for them that are you know, non fossil So you see a sort of diversity of vehicles coming. Right. And uh, well, what does it look like on, on target day? You know, when I, the clock is it the New Year's wall falls in Times Square. You know, the clock hits right. at 12.01. What does it look like on the highway at that time? What's the diversity? I think you would see, if I was to guess, I would, I would expect to see about 60 to 80 percent of the cars on the road. When we reach that day, when we have no more imported gasoline and diesel, <laughs> I would expect to see 60 to 80 percent of the cars on the road be EVs or hydrogen uh, powered cars. And then I would expect to see the, re the remainder, 20, 30 percent, be old fossil fuel powered cars that are now uh, powered by biodiesel. Okay, and biodiesel. you're guessing what a free market would do, I mean, with certain policy incentives, but right. not with any mandatory requirement. I, I don't think we need a mandate. I think we need, I think there are opportunities for mandates. For example, in public fleets, so those, those vehicles owned by the state or the counties, there's opportunities there to have mandates that the counties have to buy these type of vehicles. That's easy. They have to. Right. You don't have to twist anybody, so they must do it. Right. Condition of employment. There are those kind of opportunities, but I don't think there is a need for a big mandate on every individual person. You have to drive this type of car. Yeah. In the state of Texas, that's what we did. Uh, Wait, I want to hear more about that, but first, we'll take a break. For sure. And I mean, really, I mean, it's a cliffhanger. I'm creating a cliffhanger <laughs> because everybody wants to know your reaction to Shem's view of it. Okay, that's Mark Glick. When we come back, we're going to hear from Mark Glick all about this. I'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and one of our delights is to be partnered with Think Tech Hawaii and produce programs every week. Every Monday at 2 o'clock, we have a show called Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. So we bring people from all across the nation and the country, and certainly throughout the islands together here to talk with them about how to work together, and how to work together to do the following, to build a better economy, a better government, a better society. So if you're interested in the research of our think tank, the Gr Grassroot Institute, or if you're interested in how that's applied at the governmental and community and business levels, you'll enjoy the fascinating conversations with our guests on Ehana Kako every week on Think Tech Hawaii at 2 o'clock on Mondays. Until our next show, I'll see you. <laughs> Aloha. Mm -hmm.
Okay, we're back, we're live, and you have been waiting to hear what Mark Lick has to say. He's the, uh, the, uh, let's see, the State Energy Office in DBED, and he has some thoughts about whether we should establish a target or not for uh, fossil-free transportation. Mark. Well, it was kind of interesting. Shim was talking about uh, what you can do on the mandatory front, and one area that you might look at it are uh, fleet vehicles. In Texas, there were hard mandates uh, for percentages of fleets for public transportation, for school districts, and uh, for state fleets of over 25 vehicles. And that was uh, established in state law. And what can happen a lot of times is that over time, uh, interest can modify those, those bills. And what they did in Texas by the end of the 90s was redefine alternative fuels as reformula included in the definition reformulating gasoline which essentially gutted the, <laughs> the requirement but yeah, yeah. but it is that's a that's a valid uh, thing to do well uh, but I, I just just to clarify you maintain that some mandatory action is necessary no uh, I, I, I wasn't mandatory saying target is necessary. I wasn't saying it was a ne necessary thing to do I was saying that if you look at the litany of things you can do you can go all the way up to a hard mandatory um, requirement. But we're and not there. It, we're not there, and, and you know, it, it may or may not be a good thing to do. It can be a good thing to do, as we saw in the electricity sector. Yeah. Ray? Yeah, I, I think if you put out enough uh, incentives on getting people to drive electric vehicles by making it very easy, by m making parking uh, uh, no charge and that, those sorts of things, but also making it easy for electric vehicles in particular to find a place to hook up and top off uh, whenever you need it. Uh, and that, that, could, uh, that could actually merge in with the needs of the uh, utility grids uh, going forward. So I think if you made it easier and a lot of people would choose to drive an electric vehicle because you really don't have a range anxiety here in Hawaii and the batteries are going to get better and better so you've got more and more range but when you do need an electric charger I, I feel like we really have dropped the ball on actually getting it to be easy enough that you don't really think about it you just say alright if I need a charge here's I'll just stop here and I'll, I'll charge it that's not the I case saw, today, I saw an article recently in the last couple of days about chargers now. Did you see this? Was it the Bloomberg article? Or what? Yeah, that's right. right. Uh, and <clears throat> very fast charging. Oh, and it's a different article. Very, very fast. Okay. Um, faster than we thought. I mean, you could charge the thing, I don't know, some really high percentage of charge within like 30 minutes. Right. And that's new. That's, that hasn't happened. So, um, you know, that would be an incentive. But, you know, one thing that strikes me, though, is, you know, you're both really saying the same thing. We don't need to have this. It, it doesn't present as a mandatory kind of thing just yet. We can see how the market goes. We can see if we can use Ray as an expert on incentives. We can, you should consult with him about incentives because he knows about Well, knows we about don't want to talk about too much, do we? Because we yeah, don't want to tap little. into uh, But, you know, <laughs> we funds. can see how incentives would work, and we can try to incentivize uh, the state, you know, to move off fossil fuel and transportation. And it all, that all sounds very reasonable, but why why don't we do that on the generation side too don't the same ideas prevail there too why do we have to force people in the one category and not force them in the other oh -ho. well I'm not an electricity person so I I can't speak to that per se well the idea of course in the electricity sector which was the kickstart to the Hawaii clean energy initiative even though there was a transportation roadmap in the beginning as well, um, was that you know you had reluctant parties. So the the idea is how do you make change? How do you create a transformation? And uh, and th and there was nothing unique about the Hawaii actors in this. This is across the country. It's around the world. You go to Japan. You know you go to uh, Germany. There had been a significant. Uh, initial resistance to changing your means of generation and, and it also at times took you out of generation part of your rate base so then you're talking about kind of restructure of the whole utility um, purpose and mindset 
And I think for those reasons, it was the concept became there needed to be a compact. And you know, even with the utility stepping up to the table, they were willing to agree to mandatory targets that would keep them on track. Of course, they were stimulated by the rest of the communi community, but it made sense in that. Will we reach that point in transportation? As I mentioned, the next step is this roadmap process. And we're going to be asking for people to step up. And, you know, and there will be, I think, a healthy discussion about, well, in order to do this, we're going to need these incentives, as was pointed out. And so if we're able to work that out under a voluntary scheme, perhaps we can avoid you know, the mandates. Yeah. But ultimately, we know that importing two-thirds of our energy mix, we're not, not ever going to fundamentally change our energy security and energy resiliency challenges and, until we tackle transportation as well. Yeah. You know, a thought does occur to me um, that, that maybe we're in a different time now than we were when we were first trying to tackle transformation. Yeah. You know, we thought, uh, you know, transformation is so hard, we have to really have to get people to think differently. That's and true. now they kind of do. They kind of do think differently. And, and it's, like, it's like those kids not buying cars. Um, it, there's mm. been a change in the air over the past, what, since we've been involved, all of us, you know, four or five years anyway, uh, there's been a public change. The That's problem, point, yeah. the problem with, with cars is that I go back to my thing is... People love them? People love them. <laughs> <laughs> they love the sound of them. And they're not really crazy about the silence <laughs> of an electric. So, <clears throat> you know... Uh, well, raise the point gonna, about the Tesla, though, right. and the performance of them. Yeah. Uh, the electric drive vehicles also involve fuel cells and hydrogen. It's kind hydrogen, of exciting stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah, well, so, you know, maybe, maybe technology yeah. will change, create a new paradigm. You make a valid point. And I think this is all a valid discussion, and maybe it will happen. And maybe we're, we're ready for it now, where a year or two ago we were not ready for it, and people were not going to come this way. But I think it's the, 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 the rising of the millennials and the, the way that... This whole issue is pervading the community, and, um, and people are starting to think more about it. And uh, we're in a different time. That's that's my reaction. I'd be interested in your thought about that. Well, I, Jay, I want to talk about a couple uh, bills actually that are in the legislature this year that um, that are actually aiming at this this issue of transportation targets. So the first one is is HB twenty eighty five. You mean you don't agree with me? Uh, I do. Okay, let me just check. Uh, but I want to I wanted to focus on that <laughs> to make sure that in the discussion right. we talk about what's actually on the on the table. Okay. Uh, so the HB 2085 is a, is a bill that would actually uh, set a target, it would be a non-mandate goal to reduce the total amount of gasoline diesel consumed per year from 500 million gallons per year today to less than 1 million gallons by the year 2045. So it's, it's a goal that's essentially meant to get us 100% fossil fuel free for ground transportation by 2045. Uh, we think it's a really important bill. It's not a mandate, but it's really telling the public sector and the fleets and the condominiums that may be considering uh, putting in EV charging stations that this is where we're going. Uh, so start start thinking about that, and then that gives us kind of a destination when we uh, start doing the research and looking at which policies will have what impacts. We can kind of measure it against our destination, and that's why we think that we need to have that not not a mandate but a destination. And like you said, I think the 2045 offers some good symmetry with the electricity sector. So that's, it sounds like aspirational. It's not like a resolution almost, rather than a, a statute which, which says you must do this or you right. may not do that. Exactly. Um, that's so, what it is. Uh, so, and I guess, the, well, it's different than the than 2045 um, generational right. side of things um, because it's aspirational. Right. So, but how do you enforce that? I mean, you, you, you put don't, it out there. You, you don't, you don't, and like I said before, I don't, I don't think we need to. I think we have the other policy so tools available. Bill? So, for example, like if we are talking about ways to increase the sale of EV system where you charge, when you buy a car, you, you pay a fee for less efficient cars and you get a rebate for more efficient cars like EVs, right? So you can measure the impact of different amounts, but if you don't know what your goal is, you don't know how high you need to turn up the temperature on those individual uh, policy tools. And that's what we really need to do is, is know where we're going. So we know we need to reach, say, 60% EV new sales by 2030. OK, so we can kind of measure it against this policy tool. If you don't have those kind of targets, it's hard to gauge um, how, how um, impactful each tool will be and how 
what, l what specific numbers or policy uh, wrenches you need to throw into them. This reminds me of the All Writs Act of 1789. <laughs> and what, you know, this was adopted, this is, this is in play in the Apple versus IBM dispute right now. Okay. And it's an, old, it's an old statute. The, the court in Brooklyn said that it's no longer valid. The court in California said it is valid. And, you know, the Supreme Court will ultimately probably decide that. But <clears throat> the, the thing about the All Writs Statute is it says if there is a federal law out there and a judge feels he needs to enforce it by some kind of order, this gives him this kind of you know, over, overarching authority, sort of a general repository of authority, okay? So if you have an aspirational bill, you can say, yeah, you know, this is what we want, this is the vision we have, and we are hereby, sort of in the same way that the All Writs Act does, we are hereby delegating authority to the Department of Transportation, uh, to the PUC, whatever it is, to take such steps as it feels appropriate to to, ca to cause us to reach that aspiration. In other words, delegating. I don't think the legislature does enough delegation. They should trust the, the departments. They should trust their executives to follow through on something. So we make an aspirational statute. That's the right thing. It's an expression of policy. And then you leave it to the departments to do what they feel is right, just like the Old Ritz Act. What do you think? You have a department. I You'd do. like that, wouldn't you? Well, what I do like is that we r remain focused you know, and we, we set ambitious goals all the time. And that we remain focused on these specific actions that will get us there. And so we've been really delving more. Uh, Shem talked about what's on the table. For us, what's on the table uh, are the 22 tactics and, you know, just car share. Um, and then parking for car share. You're talking about things that could remove maybe 2 million gallons uh, per year. But when we look at those... 22 tactics, and they re required a lot of action of a lot of players. You know, about somewhere between 62 and 72 million gallons uh, towards your 500 gallon, 500 million gallon, you know, objective. So we're still kind of getting a handle on what can we meaningfully do uh, to to actually yeah. tackle this problem. But but we want to make progress now. So we want to start making, seeing these critical investments take place and get the stakeholders to voluntarily say, we support this and we will be the responsible party to see that the car share you know, program gets into place, bike share gets into place, that the transit-oriented development gets into place. And those have real big numbers associated with them. Yeah. Well, you know, it reminds me of the, uh, you know, seek permission or ask for forgiveness after. You know that kind of dichotomy yeah and so you can go and you can say do it yeah. and then you can adjust it later when people raise a storm over that or you can say well it's aspirational but we're going to take a look every year or two years i'm going to change the aspiration based on what we find we're going to tune it you know and if we need we find later on we need to do something more mandatory we'll deal with that right. later but we're sort of closing in on the target i hate to use that word we're closing in on the target so that over time, you know, state policy is revealed uh, by, by successive legislators. Yeah, and Jay, if I could just add, you know, on the electricity side, the renewable portfolio standard, the RPS that we were talking about, I really believe, you know, you, you can go back and look at the energy resource coordinator, the DBED director's reports from 1975. They said much of the same things we're saying today. You know, renewable energy, diverse portfolio, solar, wind, ocean and it had wonderful you know ideas and concepts about how to do it um, but it wasn't until the RPS concept was passed in 2001 and then made strengthened in 2008 uh, and re implementation really occurring in 2009 that we've made significant progress along with incentives so you have to have enough kind of push you know, and you have to have enough carrot and stick at the same time. And I think that's a big difference. I, I would love for everyone to sort of voluntarily do this, but it's hard to make these kinds if of things. they listen to this show, they will. We've just, <laughs> we've just got to get them to listen. So, Ray, you know, what about it? I mean, uh, you, you're going to close now because you're the co-host and well, you know you have to do okay. that. So but you might, you, might, you might ask the question rhetorically, what would San Diego do in order to get to the target? As, as an EV owner and driver, 
I will tell you that I believe you would encourage a lot more people to do what you want them to do, uh, to get away from the fossil fuel by making it easier for them. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't have to be drive an electric vehicle. It might be ride the bus. Make the bus easy. Make it put Wi-Fi in the bus. Do something, you know, that the bus encourages was free people. on the Big Island for a long time and really encouraged exactly. people to take the bus. Exactly. Make more bicycle lanes. A lot of people would ride bicycles if they didn't feel like they're uh, threatening their lives by getting on the street. Uh, if you can make it so that it's safe, it's comfortable. People would, I think a lot of people would prefer to ride a bicycle to work. And uh, with EVs, if you put chargers in more places, make them more consistent in terms of usage and how you pay and or don't pay, as the case may be, uh, people would, more people would do it. I mean, I was a, one of the first adopters just because I was interested in seeing how far we could push this. But the, there are a lot of people out there, I think, if you made it easier for them to do what we want them to do than to do what they're doing today, you would, you would head them in the right direction without any uh, sort of hammer. How, that how do have we to establish those incentives? I mean, maybe it's a rhetorical question. It's not necessarily, we only have a it's not necessarily an incentive. It is just making it easier. Whatever it is you want them to move towards, make it easier than what they're doing today, and you will start a migration. And I believe that from my own personal thoughts about, you know, why am I doing this? How would I do it more? Would I buy two electric vehicles? instead of having one that's a uh, hybrid and the other is a full electric. I would, if, if I knew that, that these things could be taken care of that worry me about electric vehicles today, finding a good place to charge when you need it, and you rarely need it, but when you need it, you need to be able to, you know, pull over to the, somewhere and charge. Okay, this is the first of nine shows, believe okay, it or not, good, on transportation. Good. All right, so you We've only for us. scratched the surface here. <laughs> thank you very much, Shem, Mark, and yep, Ray. Thank you, Jim. Great discussion, much more to come. Many more cliffhangers. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Aloha. Thank you.